Okay, good. So we're on Facebook Live. <laughs> um, so thank you for coming out and thank you on Facebook for tuning in. Um, just to get started real slowly here, most of you, you all know me, people on Facebook, if I've not met you before, Alan Clements. We're in Melbourne, the World Dharma Forum. Tonight's talk, a very unorthodox talk, super spontaneous, way unprepared, probably inarticulate, which will be good. Um, I think the title that I've written down, Trauma, Wounds, Trauma, Wounds, Trauma, Trauma, Wounds, Gashes, Psychological Scars, Oozing, Blood, Pus, Psychic, Mess, Trauma, Wounds, Genocide, Rape, Mosquito Bites, Dengue Fever, all that shit, Wounds, Trauma, being human, being an animal, being a bird, being butchered, trauma wounds, you know, picture. Dukkha, the Buddha called it, suffering. Really, really painful. It sucks for me. I hate it. Don't like it. Don't find any good reason for it. Born into it. Miserable circumstance. The Buddha's first noble truth. Being born in this world fucking hurts. Wounds. Trauma. Okay? <laughs> healing. Holy fuck, is it possible? The ideals out of Asia are a transcendent experiential embodiment of removal of the conditions for any form of physical, emotional, psychological, or existential suffering. There's an ideal put forth in this world where there is the absolute absence of suffering, trauma, wounds. Is it the healing of old perceived struggles, wounds, and traumas? Let's get into that. Um, I do say to anyone listening, and certainly to us here, and primarily to my own conscience, highly personal talk. It may or may not have anything to do with Buddhism, whatever that means to the body of those who uphold it. Not sure who you are, where you are, but I'm not a believer. I'm a humble, often pride driven practitioner of what I would call um, trying to pay attention, trying to wake up in this maddening miracle of life. I'm not sure that I'm successful, but I've done my best. So that's the title. been talking a lot the last month, listening to a lot of people, listening to my heart, and feeling that, you know, more and more intimately that I have less and less of a preoccupation to make tomorrow more important than today. I would almost say that there's an existential despair that's growing along with that perception that tomorrow may not come, which is a certainty, soon enough. But today is not felt as some kind of impassioned opportunity to live in some heightened sense of truth or expectation of a deeper, more positive resonance or whatever my reason d'etre is to be alive. I'm not sure that I have much ambition to keep the breath in breath, out breath. And yet I don't turn it off. I'm with it the best I can. But when I'm awake, I feel that we're living in this kind of volcanic existential volcano, if you will, an existential volcano with an infinite amount of kind of lava tubes and pores just spewing out corruptions and convolutions and distortions that are vague terms that point to the boy and the girl on the street who's raped and killed and murdered and butchered all over the world at this very fucking moment that we're stuck in this fabric of organic mind cognitive space-time stuff and embedded in this are humans and trees and ecosystems and birds and whales and just go back historically how much life has preceded us generations upon generations, the earth being four billion years, 
modern civilization being the last 10,000, Homo sapiens for the last 300,000, how many empires have come and gone? Just pause for a minute and just trace back our ancestry and put this vast ecosystem of interconnected shared reality that we are now a cognitive blip on this ocean of existence and just feel into the wound that people have felt. I'm trying to give a talk in my heart that makes sense about how to address healing where there is no original. That's where it all started. That's where the first wrong started. That's where the first trauma began. That's where the first aberration, that's where the first eruption of anger and rage that manifested in terms of the death of a bird, an insect, just one person somewhere in existence that cried because of the absence of being touched. And then you had huge areas of the world just ripped away by the riptides and the tsunamis of sick men and women and things and dinosaurs that just took life as if it was there only to be eaten. Healing the wounded child, healing the primordial wounds of existence. Okay, halfway done. Where are you going with this? The only sense that I've heard in my life around how to understand what it means to have a sensitive heart and begin to embrace things other than living in the conformity of a livelihood with rewards and wealth and health and sex and money and security, that people who actually feel and see more deeply into the conditioned reality of who we are, where we are, historically taking into account life wherever we want to go and what we see, taking the blinkers off, what is this thing that we're in, the Buddha? Historical, allegorical, who knows exactly what, but there's a pointing through text and people who subscribe to embodying these teachings of the Buddha. He said that there is an existence that we're embedded in and a characteristic of that existence, a very discernible characteristic, is known as dukkha. That if you have eyes that see, a mind that can feel, and into it, you will understand that you are embedded in a circumstance inevitably where you must encounter suffering. Just chill. Birth is suffering that's said in these texts. Old age is suffering. Anyone who's seen death in all the various forms from genocide to machine gun bombings to napalm to all forms of degradation of life as we know it, there's dukkha. The Buddha talked about three forms of dukkha in these traditional texts. We have the dukkha of physical struggle. If all of us in this room and online around the world would just pause and feel the heat of those who are in hospitals or on war zone streets and ghettos who just don't have what they need to survive the struggle of a physical difficulty. Think about having a tooth removed without Novocaine or nitrous oxide, that type of pain amplified times a million all over the world right now with the bugs, the trees, the insects, people, life, all life before us. That form of dukkha is so evident, so real, so discernible, but how easy it is to deny that. The Buddha said that's called obvious dukkha. Then the more internalized emotional, psychological suffering, anyone in the room, anyone online, anywhere in the world who's ever felt the pain, the pure anguish, Alan, of rejection. Things and expectations not being met in the way that they were consistently met, and all of a sudden you find yourself in a fractured psychological room where the person that you love is no longer the person that you know, and they walk on in your left in this abyss of despair and of depression and of a more intimate form of acute suffering the Buddha talked about called the suffering of internal anguish. We can't refuse that. We're propped up by emotional sandcastles and cards and sand grains and just one shift of the psychological envelope and who we were and what we have and who we're relating to and it shifts. We can't control that. And all of a sudden it comes tumbling down. All of a sudden you lose your eyes, you lose your arm, you lose your business, you lose your wealth. How many people over the world right now have been swept away 
swept away by unexpected forces and all of a sudden what they were attached to, what they felt was theirs, is no longer theirs. The more internal form of dukkha known as the dukkha or the suffering of internal struggle, anguish, sorrow, fear, depression, stress. The third form of dukkha, much more subtle, much more nuanced, almost impossible to perceive, especially if you're happy and good and healthy and young and wealthy and things are cool, but all of a sudden what they call the dukkha of oscillation, a very, very subtle form of suffering. So before I get too far into that one, particularly the dukkha of change, all of a sudden if we were to feel just this space-time, this fabric that we're stuck in, that we're embedded in, every molecule, if we had that ability to see in our mind's eye, go there in your heart, feel into everything that we are living in right now as a molecular dance. Our bodies, our minds, the millions and trillions of neurons, the heartbeat, the blood. Imagine right now if we really took it out of the conceptual framework and felt into as a doctor with a stethoscope, a scientist with a microscope, an astronomer with a telescope, an entheogenic psychonaut with the psychedelic lens that feels into this shared fabric and you really feel that everything is not just a shimmering sea of evanescent particles, but we have no control ultimately of this holographic dance that we're in, almost like phantasms on an infinite canvas of psychic physical phenomena. And there we have this thing known as the sea of Anicca the Buddha talked about, a conditioned tapestry of interrelated, shared, organic, mental and physical relatedness without central point. In a world without absolute north or south or east or west, where is up and down? Where is there a central point? Where does infinity stop and begin? The human being looks out of her eyes, looks out of her heart, hears through her ears, eats through her mouth, feels through her heart, but they think they're the center of the universe rather than a constellation of mental and physical cognitive properties in an interrelated dance without centrality to a self. The Buddha talked about the first noble truth and the second noble truth, the cause of suffering, to be very deeply interrelated with the concepts of anicca and anatta, two incredibly salient, subtle, particular insights into the characteristics of phenomenological arising, phenomenological co-arising. The individual is a dance of photons, of mind states, of physical, mental phenomena. And right now, if we go into that in a meditative, mindful lens and feel into this shared fabric of time and space, where can you say you begin and where you end, except if you take into account the illusion, hear me, the illusion of concepts? Where is there Australia? Where is there America? The Buddha pointed this out as the first particular cause of suffering, an addiction to illusions, addiction to concepts devoid of a feel for reality. Where is there woman and man? Where is there country, nationality, time and circumstance? Where is there the Indian Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, the Mediterranean, where is there north and south? Where is there a border? Where is there time? These particular illusions, if we try to figure out the wound and the trauma to trace back these things to then that event, where do we begin the entire search and trust that we're finding the original wound in a world where there is no who are we? other than a configuration of mental and physical properties without centrality, addicted to the phantasms of concepts projected on the cave walls of our own mind, taking those phantasms to be reality, and we live in these hallucinations with eyes wide open, and we live in the fiction of trying to figure out a problem that doesn't exist in time. The Buddha said, you cannot trace back to find the original source of suffering. He used the simile of a man shot with an arrow or a bullet. 
And there the man is dying of this poisoned arrow. And he's saying to the person who wants to take it out of his chest, please don't remove it yet. I want to know who shot it. I want to know from where this arrow was carved, what type of wood, which tree, which feathers of the which bird, and for what reason it was shot. All of these particular questions prolong the anguish and eventually, based upon the deluded preoccupation with source hunting, in this particular simile, according to the Buddha, in this particular text, if you believe the text, the man dies and doesn't see the immediacy of how to extract dukkha right here, right now, by engaging the conditions for co-arising participation in a suffering that exists only here and now. I don't know if you understand that. A suffering that only exists here and now based upon an unwillingness to participate in stepping back the conditions and seeing, okay, if I do this, this happens. If I cease doing that, that ceases. If I continue to give fuel to the fire, the fire continues to burn. But if I remove the air, remove the wax, or remove the wick, the fire of dukkha or suffering the Buddha talked about will go out in the moment. And you begin to see, Alan, as I was in meditation, oh my goodness, I can extract myself from participating in the co-generation of new dukkha. And therefore, there is never a place in which you can say there's a primordial source of this dukkha. A very kind of deep intellectual look in this, and let's close with the practicality of how to make this a personal affair. <clears throat> I was thinking on the time walking here tonight of, of Krishnamurti's quote, I'm not sure that I get it correct, but a measure of sanity is not how well adapted we are to an insane world, something along those lines. How we easily think that adaptation to cultural existence on the terms of that cultural expression in somehow is a successful human life. By way of saying that many people that I see along the Dharma path who are in suffering or in stress or in anxiety, who are in forms of convolution, of discord, are actually people who feel deeply and who have a very wise awakening process going on. Because as R.D. Lang, the renegade psychiatrist, said something similar to this, insanity is a sane response to an insane world. So even the notion of thinking that trauma and wounds are somehow anathema to this fabric. The very sensitivity to existence today for me is more traumatic than the most traumatic events I've ever had in my life. That's a little dirty secret of meditation. I find that the more one awakens, the more that one feels, the more sensitized one is to the fabric of dukkha, both on the most overt levels of physical dukkha, to mental forms of anguish, and to a feeling, intuitive response to the incessant sea of change and the whole realm of non-centrality or emptiness, it's as if you're vibrating in a very refined form of perpetual dukkha. And no one wants to talk about that. I have never felt more in existential stress than I ever have in my life than today. Is it a good thing? Well, all I can say is that it brings me to tears most every day. It brings me closer to wanting to feel the heart of another individual as if she's my sister, my mother, my brother, my lover, my goddess, my Buddha. I listen more carefully. Do you hear what I hear? Do you do that in your own life? Are you getting closer to people based upon your Dharma practice, your meditation practice? Are you living more in a secular life that's in a hierarchy of who's Buddhist and who isn't in the hierarchy of your own shallow pride? Or do you feel 
that it's really hard to make it in the day? Do you really feel that it's very hard to get out of bed today? Do you feel the treachery of meditation yet again because your whole life is a meditative experience of feeling the innate anicca, anatta, and dukkha of every fucking breath? No one wants to talk about getting real about how difficult it is to be awake. The wound of existence is a perpetual existential wound. And yes, there are serious violations within the space-time fabric, but where hasn't it happened? The relief from individual trauma for me is in feeling more and more the breadth of the shared reality that I've got comrades in this weird ambient existential dance that's quite frankly hellish and difficult and the only hope that I can see is to wake up with mindful empathy and feel and listen and emote and do everything humanly possible to keep alive the awakening process to get the fuck out of this nightmare dream. Fuck you. I have no idea what dharma that is, except that it's a real one. And so let's open it up to a conversation. Okay. Just had to get that off my chest. So is there anything you want to talk about or anything that might be in there that's valuable? A lot of interrelated parts in there. The Buddha's first two noble truths, three levels of suffering, different forms or the cause of suffering and addiction to concepts. And the inescapable genius of addressing the molecular dance that we're in, the physical cognitive dance that we're in, at the core omnipotent level of perception is all changing. I mean, I cannot get over that someone pointed out that every moment of existence, everything that ever is, that ever will be, is a dance of neurons and photons and impulses and conditions where there is no original core, there is no ultimate resolution, except trying to understand how to co-inhabit this organic blockchain of stuff called the cosmos and mind. Yes, there's the ideal of what the Buddha talked about in terms of a third noble truth, an enlightening process that removes the delusion concept of a self that's the perpetual subject of an ever-changing world. That makes a lot of logical sense to me. Have I met anyone who's extracted selfdom from the process? I mean, there's lots of claims to fame, but they're still over there, as far as I can see, full of a self, despite the fact that they don't have one. Maybe it's just me living in my deluded self, but it seems to me that self carries its own baggage around all the time. And you see yourself everywhere you look, even when you don't think that you have a self. So anyway, questions, comments, anything at all? I guess I could make a comment just in relationship to some things we were talking about earlier around that that sense of sensitivity, if you like, I don't know the right word, but you know, to that ever-changing, sort of moving, um, settling experience of existence and bringing, for me, that practice of open-heartedness, you know, which is, you know, a quality or, for me, you know, manifest a sense of organic experience, you know, through a mental quality that has, I guess, provided an opportunity, I don't know the best way to put it, because it's sort of an ongoing sort of learning to to bring that, that spacious open-heartedness to those experiences of, you know, of constant change and movement and un- unease or dis-ease around that process. Yeah, see, you, you, I hear that from the place of a wise practitioner. <laughs> You're a wise practitioner who has that skill to embrace metta, loving-kindness, as a way to buffer and to enhance the process of struggle. Embrace, it's almost like embracing, yeah. it's not just buffer it, because buffer's, in, I guess the word has a, has a way of providing a distance or a, 
softening, yeah. but it, it's a softening, but it's yeah, yeah, I hear you. I hear you. I, 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 I personally experience a lot of mind states as buffers. I mean, I find that love, frankly, is extremely messy. <laughs> and that when I'm less guarded in a more authentic expression of of a of a of evolving form of loving kindness, it engages complexity, it engages expectations, it engages disappointments, it engages mannerisms, it sees into the crevasses of hope and fear. It isn't a very uniformed, higher elevated form of love that I say I embrace you regardless, except, 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 except. And so, and then when I put action to loving kindness, like which is to consciously engage and elevate the status of another's hope and happiness and really seek your welfare through thought, speech, money, to really overcome how very specific my loving kindness is. It's always devoid of money, <laughs> you know, and it's always devoid of going across the parking lot to give something to somebody. So it's not a very generous form of metta. But I, I, I hear what you're saying. That it's, I think it's easy to be in the thought of loving kindness rather than in the reality of a dynamic expression of love as you've known it with partners. Yeah, but, but taking it to that, those three levels that you were talking about before of, the, you know, of, of dukkha, and engaging at those different levels with those qualities of an open-heartedness and in engagement, it, you know, it can manifest through practicalities of, on the physical level in terms of, you know, offering, you know, whether it's money or a kind gesture or whatever, and then bringing it to your own inner experience just to... I mean, and that's, a, for me, you know, I guess it's been and it still is continuing to be a way of... of just being present, you know, bring bring that presence as you've expressed. You know, just being bring that presence to the to the immediate experience of what's happening, and allowing that sort of like you know using the word love not in a romantic sense, but just like really feeling that love towards that. So you're a beautiful mind. I I don't really quite have it together <laughs> like that. <laughs> I'm I'm much more of outraged. <laughs> And I tend to see things through the filter of outrage. Well, can you can you love the outrage? I, I'm okay with I mean, uh, my the I where I embrace it, Robin, is that I feel that I have a very f intimate relationship to conscience mm. and and integrity and 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 radical authenticity to feel on the terms of how I'm feeling it rather than to spin it. And trying to bring eye, mindful eyes to articulate what is actually occurring rather than what I hope to occur. So yeah, I, I would say that. That's exactly what I'm yeah. meaning. But I'm but I. I look around and see people, and I tend to see this is a character type. I'm a dosa mula chitta, which I'm. An, are you the same? To a degree, I guess I'm working on it. Yeah, I. I tend to see the flaws in things. Who Pandita pointed that out when I met him within one hour, <laughs> in 1979. He said, you tend to see the flaws. I mean, I have good company. The Buddha apparently was a dosa mudochita. He could see, I mean, a wisdom type sees the flaws in things. And I don't pride myself on that, but I'm a real doer, a fixer. I'm, I'm a good person to be in an emergency with. Uh, I help out. And, you know, I would really try to... But could it be better? Fuck yeah. I'm wanting more from the team. Mm -hmm. And could the team be all of existence? Yeah, let's get on with it, guys. Let's fucking remove this bullshit from the scene. I wish I was a president. I wish I had more power. I wish, I wish, I wish. Am I struggling on yeah? And could people do more? Absolutely. Fuck all, man. Do more. So I'm more of the kind of like, let's get on the story rather than giving loving kindness to the flaw. Well, you, I'm not good at metta. I did metta practice for about two weeks, and it just made me pissed off. Well, I've heard, heard that happens to people. But I've, yeah. <laughs> Upanti said, this is not for you. He said, you are among the rare people that it does not work. And, and there's, 
I dare say thank you very much. He said, often very smart people cannot do metta. Mm. Well, I figure I'm pretty smart, actually, to be blunt, without being sort of, you know, sort of unreal. But I, I guess and it's something that I've come to later in my practice to actually do intensive metta practice. Mm-hmm. And, well, at, you know, going back to our earlier conversation again, bringing that, you know, like that sort of quality of, you know, sati is... Mm-hmm in a way that can become a little bit cold and a little bit striving. For me, you know, I think because of that particular nature of my mind, and mm-hmm. for me, I found that meta practice is, is a real complement to that, that quality. Beautiful. I mean, you know, I, I'm sort of, it's just an ongoing learning process. Namaste. I mean, I, 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 I like, where I go in my heart today is, what does real love look like? Yeah. You know, and I, having been in complex areas, metta is not an idea. Metta is an impetus to be the best f- expression of love I can be, but it may be a little bit edgy. <laughs> it may be a little bit like I'm going to point out a little bit of what I'm feeling here and really kind of get messy with you a little bit. Like, where's the honesty in the love? Mm-hmm. A lot of metta practitioners are living in kind of a Colgate smile no, 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 facade. Not, not, not you, I know no, you. No, but I'm, I know, I but that's like the other side of like the, mm-hmm. the, the, in, the sati practice as well. Absolutely. Both of them have those sort of like near enemies, if you like. That's right. You know, it's this sort of sense. Well, a good, a good example, maybe you were here when I brought it up, you know, I was... I spent the last year in the former Yugoslavia, the for- last year of the war in Croatia. And the city of Zagreb was surrounded by warring soldiers and men and women, as was Sarajevo was under siege. The whole country was a three-way genocide. But more to the point was those who came from the European Union and from Australia or America or other places in South America to, to volunteer Uh, they were all Christian Catholics and not one Buddhist. Where's your fucking metta in action? 43 months of fucking televised genocide. Ah, no Buddhists. It's fantasy love, fantasy compassion. And I don't diss the Buddhists, but they diss themselves. At the retreat that we just did, Nicole was there, the gentleman, um, Mel was there, um, uh, Greg. Greg. Greg asked a Buddhist who's leading a Buddhist forum up in the north this week, I think, was asking what I would recommend on how to rejuvenate the Buddhist tradition in Australia. He asked me that question because he was asking the question and was going to present it. And I, I thought that it would be a wonderful gesture, not just to Buddhists, but anyone concerned with states of consciousness, empathy and compassion to really go and to put yourself in situations of service and to forget teaching, forget meditation, forget mindfulness, forget asana, forget all of it, and just simply go as a volunteer somewhere, anywhere, in the inner city, outer city, other country, and just give over as you would to empathy and compassion in simple clumsy, elegant action and see what that does to you for the amount of time that you can afford to do that, whether it be a week, a month, six months, or a year. And then come back and see how that informs your mindfulness teaching. Um, no, I think that's a great idea. Yeah. And so he took active notes and I think it's being presented. And But it's more of, you know, time's running out. We're in a critical time on planetary history climate change, abrupt warming, you know, just the New York Times even did a big piece today on how the, uh, the ice caps are melting far faster than even the predictions that we're looking at, you know, catastrophic sea level rises and the potentials of loss of habitat and all this is going on simultaneous to this big ongoing heat engine that we're embedded in this called Western Industrial Civilization. And yet there's this whole other existential tsunami building, this existential cyclone called possibly the sixth great extinction 
that's simultaneous to our arrogance of denial. And there's no easy translation of that reality, but those who have their hands on that particular information, and there are a lot of people, what you said could be so everything today, as it's been said by one particular climate genius, that all that's left at the edge of extinction is love. It could be that there's nothing else more appropriate to do today than to just simply do exactly what you're saying, to love with everything we've got, wherever we are, with whom we're with. I mean, it's, that's, a, that's sort of, well, I'm, here I'm listening to myself and saying like, why not just do that? Why not just make that your occupation? Well, I mean, you are in a sense by doing what you're doing now, do you think? Yeah, yeah. why not? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, love it, love it, love it. I think I, I think I'm really. I've seen vast improvements in my being in this last five years. Humbled, on the altar of 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 unexpected anguish. Um, seeing the the tenacity, and resolve that I only got to witness Robin in war zones and in Burma with political prisoners and activists who are willing to put themselves on the front lines. Do what you need to do with me, but I refuse to be a slave to your idiocy. I mean, that is courageous, way cool. And I see that I've taken on just a little bit of that behavior to just stand up to the demon of my own denial and open to my vulnerability and to see the authenticity of a more, one of the best kept secrets is just this, that you are a good person. Because the society is out there just trying to tell you and condemn you and shame you into the oblivion that they're, you know, they're, they're, they're sinking in the quicksand of their own egoism. Yet they're often super successful and prominent in society. And they want to belittle. It's as if the ego has gotten such the better of them. And the whole notion of an interrelated openness informed by compassion is so selective that it's compassion and empathy and loving kindness are all euphemisms today for greed, anger, and delusion. They're being used to support the delusions of spiritual, often yogic, dharmic hierarchy. Look at the stuff that we're witnessing in some of the traditions, not just the Catholic Church with predator pedophilia, but in the Buddhist Church, Sogyal Rinpoche, and how many other examples, the aberrations of consciousness and Dhamma. So, thank you for that. Appreciate talking up and sharing. <clears throat> we're good? Nothing? No. Is healing an appropriate way to approach your perception of a wound? Um, I think anything at all that an individual aspires that supports them being better, open, more full, more conscious, more giving, more loving, tending to their soul, tending to their psyches in any way, shape, or form, addressing the perpetrators, going back to the sources of the struggle and the crime, whatever is required to address, to heal, to feel better, be more empowered, go there, do that. And there is also, simultaneous to that, a more immediate, a more intimate, potentially complementary way to address the dukkha at a deeper level as well. So it's the simultaneity of multiple approaches rather than the singular approach of that particular approach being the only way. That's all. Okay, namaste. Thank you for listening. Thank you on Facebook. Thank you all for being here. See you soon, Monday and Thursdays through June, and we'll carry on. Thank you. Mm -mm.